Hi, this is Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College. This is our first video out of seven on the blood. We will spend quite a bit of time on the cardiovascular system to which, of course, the blood belongs. Um, after the blood, we will focus on the heart, and after the heart, we will focus on blood vessels and blood pressure regulation. So stay tuned for possibly more videos after the blood. In this particular video A, we're going to introduce you to the blood, uh, take a look at its major functions and uh, what it's made up of. So the blood has many functions. You already know that it carries around oxygen, collects carbon dioxide from our metabolically active tissues, also wastes. It also distributes nutrients so that our tissues can produce ATP, for instance. But let's not forget that our blood also carries around some other important chemicals like all kinds of electrolytes, hormones, um, proteins that are uh, involved in clotting. We call them clotting factors. We'll talk more about those later on. And another important thing is that our blood carries around heat. So our blood actually plays an important role in regulating our body temperature. But we also see that our blood very carefully controls its own pH, aside from our body temperature, as well as the fluid volume in our body, whether it's uh, the blood volume itself, the volume of lymph in our blood, uh, the volume of all of the extracellular fluids around the cells, even the fluids within the cells, the intracellular fluids, etc. Our blood, of course, plays a very important role in inflammation. Many of our white blood cells uh, play a role in the inflammatory process, and we will learn about the different white blood cells that are involved in that. Um, within the white blood cells, we also have a, a class that we refer to as the lymphocytes, and they play an important role in immunity. And finally, our blood contains these proteins we call clotting factors that um, are responsible for allowing our blood to clot so that we can seal off wounds. Now notice what it says in this last bullet. This is kind of an important thing to remember. Our cardiovascular system is our first organ system to develop uh, in the embryo. It, it starts to already form in the third week of gestation. And it, let's think about that for why that is so important. We just looked at all the functions of the blood. Remember, it, it, um, it provides the tissues with oxygen and nutrients, and it removes from the tissues carbon dioxide and other ways. So in order for our cells to be able to divide and our si tissues to persist and, and develop properly to where they can form other organs, clearly it's important that the blood can be distributed, that the heart can be pumping to where it can push around the blood, um, and therefore we also need blood vessels. In other, in other words, we need that cardiovascular system to develop as soon as possible. We don't easily think of blood being a tissue, but you might recall from Anatomy and Physiology Part 1 that blood is actually a connective tissue. And it is a connective tissue because it actually abides by the three criteria that makes a tissue a connective tissue. For one, blood contains plasma, which is essentially the matrix of the connective tissue. It has what we refer to better as formed elements, which are your white blood cells and your red blood cells and your platelets. And I'll explain to you shortly why we don't tend to call them cells so much as formed elements. And then finally, even though fibers are not always present in our blood, we do find that our blood has the capability of making fibers during the clotting process. And the presence of fibers, of course, is also a major characteristic of the connective tissues. So the presence of matrix, the presence of some, some kinds of cells, and the presence of fibers, or the ability to make fibers, all are the criteria that must be met in order for a tissue to be grouped into the connective tissues. And blood uh, follows these different criteria. Blood has a, a, a rather sticky feel 
and it tastes metallic and rather salty. I think we all know that. We've all, uh, I hate to say so, but licked our wounds. The metallic taste is mostly contributed to the presence of iron in the hemoglobin protein that is found within the red blood cells, which we will study. The hemoglobin within the red blood cells binds oxygen, and depending on how much of the oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin, we will see that the hemoglobin can become really bright red if um, lots of oxygen is bound, while it becomes a much darker color if much less is, is oxygen is bound, which contributes to the changes in our skin color. We might look a little bit more bluish when, like our lips might turn blue, or our nails might turn blue in particular, when there isn't as much oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, while we might look really nice and red um, if lots of oxygen is bound. We also say that our blood is characterized by viscosity. In other words, our blood is kind of thick, kind of syrupy. We will use the term viscosity quite a bit, so uh, keep an eye out for it. The pH of the blood is not exactly neutral, but pretty close to it. It's ever so slightly basic. Remember your pH scale, which goes from zero to neutral at seven to 14, with from seven to 14 base being basic, while from zero to seven being acidic. Remember too that another way of referring to basic is by calling it alkaline. So our blo blood is slightly alkaline, and its temperature is ever so slightly above our body temperature. Finally, it's going to be very important for all of you to remember the average amount of blood that we all have in our body. And on average, a good number for you to remember is five liters. So all of us on average have about five liters. Now, if we're females, we have a bit less. And if we're males, we have a bit more. Of course, that all depends on your size as well. Um, but keep that number in mind, five liters. So our blood is made up of the matrix, which we refer to as the plasma, which is a very, very watery fluid. And it makes up typically almost a little bit over half of our blood. So if we look at a sample of our blood here in a vial or in a little test tube or even in a little centrifuge tube, that, and we, we centrifuge the blood to where the parts or the components of the blood will separate according to density, we see that in a healthy individual, a little bit over half of our blood should be the watery plasma. So about 55%, we'll say. And the remainder is made up of those so-called formed elements. That includes our red blood cells and white blood cells and also platelets, which in animals, by the way, we often refer to them as thrombocytes. Remember, site always means cell. Thrombo, as in thrombus, platelets are, play an important role in creating clots. And another way of referring to a clot that might be stuck in a blood vessel is to refer to it as a thrombus. In, 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 like I said, in, in humans, we tend to use the term platelets more than thrombocytes, although um, I think it's fine for you guys to use the term thrombocytes. Now, why are we referring to them collectively as formed elements, all these red and white blood cells and the platelets? Well, that is because the majority of them lack a nucleus and even organelles, with the exception of our white blood cells. Now, which ones of these terms here are the white blood cells? Well, leuco literally means white. I already went over why we refer to the platelets sometimes as thrombocytes. And then the red blood cells are referred to as erythrocytes because erythro refers to red. Now, if we focus on just our formed elements, notice that the layer of that we see here in the red is all red blood cells. So almost, almost all of our formed elements are red blood cells. Only a very small percentage of our formed elements 
are made up by leukocytes and platelets. So if we use some numbers in the form of percentages, notice that almost 45% of the formed of our blood sample, I should say, is going to be made up of red blood cells. 55% is made up by plasma. If we add up these numbers, clearly we get to 100%. So um, the amount of white blood cells and platelets is, is quite small. And so we just say there's less than 1%. Notice too that all these leukocytes and platelets collect in the layer that sits in between our red blood cells at the bottom of the tube and the plasma which collects near the top of the tube. And so here we have something we refer to as the buffy coat. It's this cloudy-ish layer, thin, thin, thin layer in between the plasma and the red blood cells that contains all of the white blood cells and the platelets. All of these numbers presented so far are important for you to memorize. Uh, most of you in your health profession will be dealing with um, blood reports from your patients and so you need to have a bit of a feel for what these percentages should be in a healthy individual so you can compare it to what it is in your patients. Notice too that there's a term shown up here called hematocrit or sometimes referred to as a VPRC which stands for volume of packed red blood cells. Most often though we use the term hematocrit and um, you might see hematocrit abbreviated on a patient's lab report as capital H little c little t and this is um, or when you see the term hematocrit on a blood report, it literally represents the total percentage of blood, red blood cells in the sample of blood uh, of your patient. And again, in a healthy patient, that should be approximately 45%. That should be at the higher end for males, because males have more red blood cells. We'll see why in just a moment in one of the other videos and at the lower end uh, in females. So a female might be more around 40%, give or take, while a male may, might be more in the mid uh, 40s to higher up in the 40s. Let's focus now for a moment on just the plasma of the blood. Remember, it should make up a little bit more than half of our blood sample collected from our patient, about 55%, and it's almost all watery. So it's a very, very watery solution. Don't forget that. But it's within the plasma that we find many of the proteins that play an important role uh, in our blood. Electrolytes, that's also where the heat is carried, hormones, the nutrients, all kinds of nitrogenous wastes, which include things such as uric acid, urea, and many more. Uh, the gases, on the other hand, uh, some of them, as we'll see, are indeed dissolved in the plasma, but many of them um, are not. We'll focus on that later. Let's come back to some of the most abundant and important proteins in the plasma. There are more, but these are some of the more, most important ones. Um, those are called the albumins, the globulins, and fibrinogen. It's important, once again, that you know these relative percentages. So of the three most abundant and important plasma proteins, albumins make up almost, not quite, but almost two-thirds of the plasma proteins. They play a very, very important role in something we refer to as colloid osmotic pressure. In simpler words, what that means is that the presence of the albumins in our blood ensure that water is kept inside of our blood. A person who starts to not be able to produce enough albumin because liver, the, our liver um, synthesizes albumins, if that person can't make enough albumin, 
that person is not going to be able to hold on to enough water in his or her blood and the water will leave the bloodstream, which will then lead to something we refer to as edema. A person begins to swell. There are different reasons for why a person might suffer from edema, but having low levels of albumin, possibly because of a failing liver, is um, very, very characteristic. These albumins are also going to play a role in buffering our blood. Remember, our blood needs to be kept at that pH of about 7.4, give or take a little bit. Um, and therefore, they can function in binding um, certain acids, such as fatty acids, for instance, to ensure that pH is maintained. The second major group of plasma proteins make up about a third of the total plasma proteins, and they're called the globulins. They have many functions, but they're major transporters, such as of, of hormones or anything that is not very soluble, um, hormones included, or even things that, um, if they weren't bound to these globulins, we would lose them uh, through filtration in the kidneys. Some of our globulins are specialized in um, being antibodies, or we can call them immunoglobulins, and play, of course, an important role in uh, defending our body. And once again, most of these globulins are made by the liver and some even by the immune system. The antibodies are made actually by plasma cells, which arise from lymphocytes. Finally, fibrinogen is a precursor molecule to fibrin. In other words, fibrinogen is an inactive form. It needs to be activated to become fibrin. That's why I called it a precursor molecule. Fibrin is the protein that makes up the little strands during clot formation. Once again, a protein formed by the liver. You're beginning to see what crucial or how crucial a role our liver plays when it comes to producing uh, very, very important proteins in the body, which explains already why people who go into liver failure have all kinds of complications. As you know by now, the formed elements include our red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells or leukocytes, and then the platelets, which you could also call the thrombocytes, particularly in animals. All of these formed elements have a relatively short lifespan, anywhere from just minutes to hours um, to maybe a few months. Um, but most of them do not live very long. None of them can divide once they have been formed, which is why we call them A without mitotic, without the capability of going through mitotic divisions. And of all these formed elements, only our white blood cells contain a nucleus with organelles, and therefore only the white blood cells are true cells. All the other ones, that is the red blood cells and the platelets, lack either a nucleus or a nucleus and organelles, which is why we refer to the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets collectively as the formed elements. All of our formed elements are formed inside of our red bone marrow and by a process which I think you might have already been introduced to in the past called hemato, blood, poesis, the making of. So hema, hemo always refers to blood. Poesis, think of it as forming or synthesizing or creating. Uh, those are all good uh, synonyms for you to remember for, uh, to translate the Greek root poesis. All of our formed elements arise from one stem cell um, that then begins the process of hematopoiesis. That stem cell has several different synonyms. Most often you'll see it being referred to as the hemocytoblast or the hematopoietic stem cell. And again, you see the term hematopoiesis in there basically. Let's take a look at a flowchart in the next slide that gives us a nice overview of the process of hematopoiesis. And then you will see uh, 
that there are two arms to the whole pathway. Uh, one arm that um, is going to give rise to what we call the myeloid stem cell and another one that gives rise to the lymphoid stem cell. So here then we see a very nice overview of hematopoiesis, which starts with our hematopoietic stem cell, which we can call the hemocytoplast as well, and which ultimately produces all of the formed elements. So the platelets, our red blood cells, and all of the different kinds of white blood cells. A very busy cell, that hematopoietic stem cell, which is why we refer to it as a multipotent or sometimes even pluripotent stem cell. It's a stem cell that has the potential to make many different cells. Now, the first thing it's going to do is to just go through a mitotic division to where it makes all kinds of, well, to where it makes, I should say, uh, it's typical to clones. We refer to them typically as, as you know by now, as daughter cells. Well, one of those daughter cells continues to go through mitotic divisions and keeps cranking out hematopoietic stem cell. We don't want to run out of our hematopoietic stem cells in our red bone marrow. The other daughter cell, on the other hand, is the one that will kick into the whole differentiation process to produce all of these different um, formed elements. So let's focus on this daughter cell. Notice that when it differentiates the first time, it gives rise to two major arms, as I call them, in our pathway. One arm um, starts out with the so-called myeloid stem cell, while the other arm starts out with the lymphoid stem cell. Now, of these two stem cells, we notice that the lymphoid stem cell is pretty limited in what it ultimately differentiates into. It's going to give rise to our lymphocytes and um, another type of lymphocyte, which we refer to as a natural killer cell. The remaining white blood cells all arise from the uh, other major stem cell called the myeloid stem cell including the erythrocytes and even our platelets. So the myeloid stem cell is still in many ways um, a multipotent stem cell if, if we look at how many different kinds of cells it can give rise to. By the way, it might help you to remember the names of these different stem cells by the fact that our lymphocytes, they um, start to be produced in the red bone marrow, but they do not finish development um, and do not become, I should say, uh, immunocompetent until they hit one of the lymphoid tissues. From there, the term lymphoid stem cells. All of these other cells um, pretty much finish forming inside of the red bone marrow. Maybe not so much the final form of our red blood cell. We, we actually see that the reticulocyte enters into the, the bloodstream, not a mature red blood cell. But still, in general, most of the other cells mature inside of the red bone marrow. And from there, the term myeloid, which typically refers to the red bone marrow. Maybe that'll help you remember these two arms with their cells. So this wraps up our first video on the blood. We'll next take a look at red blood cells.